Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Cheaper Than Therapy. Vanessa and I could not be more excited for today. We're geeking out. Oh, my goodness. Um, so we have Deborah Silverman joining us today. And Deborah is <laughs> an astrologer, a teacher, a psychotherapist, an author, um, someone that Vanessa and I have both just been a huge fan of for a really, really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, over the past 40 years, Deborah has helped thousands of people, individuals, families, couples achieve emotional health and wisdom. Deborah, thank you so much for doing this. We're so excited to get to talk to you. You're so welcome. I like the surfboard in the back of your head. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in Los Angeles. You got to play the part, right? <laughs> I understand. I'm in Hawaii, so we're in the same family. We've got the uh-huh. ocean somewhere between us. Somewhere. <laughs> Um, you know, like that, like Danae said, I mean, I think one of the reasons we were so excited to have you on is because we've both been just followers and fans for a really long time. And, um, I don't know, never thought that we'd actually get an opportunity to talk to you on our, our little mm-hmm. podcast. You <laughs> said about, um, there we go. There's something to be said about being a well-known something or other that I, don't really identify with because I've just been doing what I love for so many years. And because I'm in my mid sixties and I've gotten older, it's become obvious that my reputation has followed me around, but (laughs) it wasn't my intention. My intention was just, I was in love with astrology. I am in love with astrology. I feel like we've just fallen in love a week ago. So Mm. because I'm so in love with it, it surprises me whenever I get on these podcasts and they're like fangirling me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just an astrologer. Don't be so impressed. But I can see if I had to, because it's been a puzzle to me, you know, yeah. just even as a therapist, like what is that dynamic mm-hmm. that you become so good at something or you do it so long that then people notice and then they want your opinion and then they think you know shit. And that's what <laughs> You're like, wait, what? Expert? Who? Me? You're like, hold on, hold on. I'm I'm still just as curious. So um well that's it. Being just as curious, right? Like maintaining that curiosity. I think that's that's the kind of key. Yes. And I've never stopped. I mean, humans are the weirdest creatures I've ever encountered Amen. on my planet. <laughs> we do not act like this. So, so because I've just arrived here just about a week ago and I'm like trying to figure out still the human condition, the mm-hmm. chart helps me. It gives me like the shortcut to go, oh, well, that makes more sense. Well, here's what I, I, what I want to start to, cause you kind of already led into this and before we recorded, we were kind of, you know, meandering around this topic. So a while ago I posted something about astrology and, you know, I got in a couple of DMs from people like you're a therapist, like you shouldn't be talking about, you know, I always get at least one or two of those. And I love how you say that astrology and psychotherapy are best friends. And Danae and I are both, we have a depth background. And so what we were saying before we hopped on to record was that you can't study Jung without studying astrology. I mean, he, he was, he was, astrologer. yeah, his daughter was famous for it well, because she, he taught her she, he, when she was young, she executed the charts and every single session he did same for me. I never, ever did a session without a chart in front of me. Mm. He said it, it was his quote, psychology will be a dinosaur science until it includes astrology. Because mm. when someone comes to sit with you, this is how it all started. I was in graduate school at Antioch studying clinical psychology and people would come sit down with me and the supervisors, I remember this so vividly, and they'd start complaining about their stupid personalities. Raise your hand if you have a stupid personality. <laughs> And then I would, I would think to myself, this is not a stupid person. This is completely predictable what you're Mm -hmm. describing right now. Let me help you reframe it from the angle of the stars. And that changes the angle, the point of view, like, oh, you talk too much. Well, you're an Aquarian. Oh, you're a mess. Well, you're a Libra. Oh, you have a really hard time understanding how to deal with people. Well, you're a recluse. You've got so much, like, why can't we just say it's nothing's wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I do think that that feels so affirming to hear, Deborah, because I feel like when we were at Pacifica studying depth psychology, I was a little like, I mean, I thought astrology was interesting, but it was like so over my head that I was like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know where you was at a pun. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. But I, when I finally got my chart read, which was actually, I think, well, yeah, I think in 2020, like right before all of this happened, I had my first Mm -hmm. astrology reading and it like blew my mind open. It was my first natal chart reading where it was just like, I felt seen in a way that I'd never felt seen before. I felt like such a depth of self-acceptance that I I now love recommending that my clients get their chart read because it's like so much of what you're pathologizing about yourself, so much of what you feel like is wrong with you is just who you are. This is your nature. 
It's true. It's all about what you think is wrong. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, for, for those who, who are not fangirls like us, I mean, will you give us a little bit of background? You know, how did you kind of come into this best friend relationship? So you were at Antioch, which I did not know that you went to Antioch. It's one of our no. kind of sister schools. Um, and, and the, I mean, were you already practicing astrology? I started, you know, as a little person, I, I must've been like, I don't know, 10 years old when I first found my first astrology. It's so cute to think of little <laughs> Debbie, little Debbie and the stars and we're so over my head. And then fast forward, I turned like in my twenties. Um, and then I suddenly found, how did it go? The first astrologer that I saw, like exactly what you just said, I couldn't believe it. Like she knew me better than my mom knew me. And I was Mm -hmm. so young. I was like, whatever you just did, I want to do. And then it was not more than six months later that I was in a car driving from Toronto to Alberta, to Pinoca, Alberta for three days with a woman who was a triple Gemini for God's sake, and an astrologer. She was an astrologer. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, can you teach me this? So I just wrote every single thing she said down. She said, there's a whole bunch of books in the backseat. I was like, no, I'm an auditory learner. Just keep talking. And I just wrote everything down, wrote everything down. And at the end of those three days, I got out of the car and you guys will appreciate this. I had a dream because I'm a big dreamer. Mm -hmm. Um, In the dream, this, I used to have this little Chinese lady follow me around when I was little in my dreams. And she told me that she said, stop acting so dumb. You've been an astrologer for lifetimes. And I woke up startled and I started charging people. (laughs) I love that. So amazing. (laughs) So that was the entrance of me being an astrologer and it came and followed me. It never, it's never to this day. I'm literally still madly in love with it. So I, I respect therapists that refer their clients to a good astrologer who's well-versed in this because it is a large, timeless science. Um, And I really respect the astrologer who studies it because the psychologist, because understanding their uniqueness when you're doing a session Mm -hmm. so that you're not imposing, like, what if you have an eccentric who Mm -hmm. loves nudity or you have someone who loves science and they live, they're like a five in the Enneagram and they're intellectually starving to never be around people. And you're like, can I help you make new friends? Or why don't you put your clothes on? No, <laughs> yeah. that's not nice. You, you identify their universe mm. and then you support them. But how do you know their universe is actually accurate and they're not faking or pretending or, you know, accommodating someone that imposed on them if you don't look at the chart? Wow. You know, This is fascinating to me because you're saying you're an auditory learner. I am fascinated by astrology and I find it overwhelming. And I don't know, like, what are some of the other ways people can start to teach? I'm telling you, Dana, I I am an auditory learner. So the way I teach is in bite sized bits, Mm -hmm. super small. I have a school. It starts in um, February. Yeah. Tell us about this. And you guys are both eligible for the 50% discount because you have a podcast. Oh, (laughs) maybe I need to go. It's it's a very, the class is six weeks long. You'd be shocked. Mm -hmm. And you learn it in like, first you learn the elements, which is my book, The Missing Element. It's very simple. The elements like that's not hard. That's already in your system. Mm -hmm. Water, you're sensitive. You cry. Air, you talk all the time. Airheads. Earth, practical, the money people that want the go and then fire the ones that are a little excited. Don't look at me. They get super enthusiastic over nothing. So you just learn first the elements of first class and you get that into your bones. And it's super simple for a depth psychology. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you love that stuff. Yes. And the second class, which is what you're talking about is mercury. How does your mind work? Mm-hmm. So if you're like, I'm looking at your chart in a moment, cause they just sent it to me. Once I know what system your mind works with, then I know, like, for example, your mind is in cap, your earth. Is it, how do you say your name? Danae. Danae. So you have to learn things practically. You can't just learn things that are theory. Yeah. Like show me the money. Like <laughs> how does this work? So yeah. that's how we're going to teach you. We, then we custom design the class, knowing now that your mercury is in earth, we're going to teach it to you by simple assignments in really particular. So we, we really literally have a school that's based on the learning styles. Oh my mm. gosh, that is so cool. Well, and that's just, I mean, God, as a therapist, the amount of um, suffering that would be eliminated uh, if people were able to be around more people, whether it's their parents, whether it's their teachers, whether it's their therapists that actually spoke to them and worked with them in the way that they 
take in information, right? I mean, I know I've struggled in a lot of school because of that. Um, like I'm very tactile. And so, you know, it, it's, I'm but similar to today and like, I need to be very, oh. <laughs> so we have, so yes, yeah, she's got earth. Hold on one moment, please. Mm-hmm. And you have mercury in, wait, this is the same chart twice again. They only, wait, that's ridiculous. Oh, here it well, is. You're I, got earth it. Too, right? I got it. Yeah. And your mercury is in fire. So you have to get it for you learning, Vanessa, it has to be inspirational or you're out. Like as yeah. soon as someone goes on and on and on, you're like, are you kidding me? Just get to the point. That sounds about right. I think I've <laughs> said those exact words multiple times. Yeah. So, so this is what I'm talking about mm-hmm. in the way that I teach it in our school. And this is why I'm encouraging all of you therapists that are listening to this or people that are interested. Mm-hmm. You don't, I always say this, you don't have to believe in astrology. It believes in you. So you don't need to have a theory about it, but it's, it's waiting for you to give you back your promise. It's waiting for you to study you. Mm-hmm. What is more important than studying you? I mean, you're talking to a therapist. I mean, we said nothing. <laughs> this is like the obsession of our lives. We do this shit all day. <laughs> Let's be real. Oh my God. Why we do it. I love it. So your book, will you actually... Um, Will you break down this concept of the elements for those who don't kind of understand, like just very like top level, like what was the inspiration for you, I guess, to write that book? Um, and, and how have you found that to be helpful in practice with people? I mean, I know elements from like an Ayurvedic perspective, but I actually wasn't super aware of the kind of connection with astrology. So all of astrology is steeped in the elements, the Egyptian whole culture. I live here in Hawaii. All of the Hawaiian culture is steeped in the elements. The old Jews that, that practice Kabbalistic Judaism, mm-hmm. the four worlds, it's all based on four elements. In the Tarot deck, on the magician's card, he has the four elements sitting in front of him, her, her. She has to have the elements in front of her to do any kind of magic at all. So how I found it was... Um, Good question. It was a, I, it's embarrassing to say I was kind of in a cult when I was young. <laughs> I mean, I found a spiritual cult. Is that a cult? If it's a spiritual group, I found a spiritual group. It wasn't a cult. <laughs> it was a spiritual group and they based everything on the four elements. And so when I, and they do it backwards mm. in the system, I learned the esoteric system. It starts with water because you spend nine months in water, mm. like creation occurs and it's the invisible world. But this system that old astrology started in fire the big bang theory. So it's a very different model, but the four elements remain the same. Water is the nonverbal, emotional, sensitive beings who cry mm-hmm. at the drop of a hat and they're reclusive because people annoy them too mm-hmm. much. Stimulation, they don't want to play. And they're extremely good with animals and children and cooking and cuddling and playing in the house. They just like everything warm and fuzzy because they're sensitive. <laughs> Am I nailing you? No, but I'm thinking of a very specific friend that you're, I, I, our friend, Christina, I feel like I could be like, this is you, (laughs) but she's really Capricorn energy too. I feel like I love the waters and they are like, no, get back. Yes. Well, you're going to see that the goal of the game, by the way, is to have all four, Yeah, Mm -hmm. four wheels in a car. So if one goes down, the whole system goes off, but there'll be some that are easily accessed. Mm -hmm. So water is the depth psychology and talking about trauma. And they love when things are emotionally uncomfortable. They love when people are crying. They feel more comfortable when people are crying. And then the air people are next and they hate when people are crying. They're like, detach, cut off, just talk, live in your head, take notes, write books, and don't get too caught in your feelings. What are feelings? I'll read a book on it. (laughs) They're such different. Yeah, they're real intellect. And yeah. they're really truly underlining things in the books and they're making little notes and they're raising their hand with questions and one more question. And yeah, we got her. We just nailed Vanessa. So <laughs> the other people are endless podcast listeners. They can't get enough mm. information, documentaries, watching movies. So it's air is distinct from water, which was like, Ooh, all those words for a water person. It's annoying. Yeah. Silence is their favorite person. So that's the water, then comes the air, the intellects, then comes the earth people. And they are really genuinely built for practicality. Like mm. this is the Taurus, Virgo, Capricorn. Yeah. See, I tend to, in my book, the, literally in my book, there is no zero astrology. In the, it's called the missing element. Mm. And on the, in the middle of the book, there's a test. It takes five minutes. You figure out your missing element. And then you go read that chapter. Because clearly one of these four, you'll say, oh, that's me. Mm-hmm. And then one, you'll be like, mm. So earth people clean for fun. 
Like they like doing taxes. Don't I, this is not my category. They're like, oh, I guess. Yeah, and they, <laughs> they, they really get off on checking things off their list. Like that's sexy for them. Like they mm -hmm. write things down. Some earth person I knew, she wrote a list of all the people she invited to the party. And then she made a list of who she didn't invite. I said, why, <laughs> why do you have a second list? But that was like her, her, and then she would save both in a folder called party. That's earth. They like organize the shit out of the shit. Like we're going to make this whole thing. We're going to- Can you be two things? <laughs> Yes, that's my okay. point. You can be for all four of them. Okay. And then the last category is the energized bunny who just constantly has to have fun, constantly has to be jumping up and down, has to go on the surfboard, then they have to go play tennis, and they have to go for a ride, then they have to go for a hike. That's and if they partner. don't move energy, they get tired. They're, the fire people are all fired up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're jacked up and they've got a lot of juju and it's annoying to people that don't have fire. They're like, where is the volume knob on this kid? <laughs> <laughs> they talk loud, you know, they're, and the water, you can imagine fire and water. The water's like, why is she so loud? It's starting to hurt my feelings. So this is where you learn. And this course, there's combinations, endless right. 7.8 billion combinations. And the goal of my game in the book is what's the missing element, which is the name of the book. And then how do you cultivate the one that you're missing? Cause that will balance the game. I love that. Yeah. I mean, even when I work with people around, you know, whether they're introverted, extroverted, intuitive judgment, right? Like all of our kind of like our quadrant, um, it's, it's important to understand where you fall so that you have a sense of self-acceptance and self-understanding, but it's not just about, let me understand it and accept it period. And then stop there. It's, it's also to understand if these are your kind of, um, the weaker links, if you will, you know, how can I lean into the discomfort and, and strengthen areas? that actually are not that strong for me um, in order to find more balance. Oh, we lost Sorry. your audio. There I you just are. Muted for, that is the whole process is balance. So essentially my whole life's work is two things. Turn on your observer, mm. that's what the book is about. Like that's what you guys do as a therapist. Mm -hmm. Let me help you turn your awareness on so you can look at yourself. And then two, how do you balance so you're not off center? Because so many people suffer because they're giving too much or they're not giving enough or they're too loud or they're too, like there's a million variations of how they're all, can I just swear, all fucked up. I mean, but, the, the, but the question is, if you become observant yep. and aware of yourself, hmm. there's freedom. There, there's this free will button. And that's what astrology and what the book is all about, giving people back freedom. Mm. I love that so much because I feel like a lot of the resistance I hear people have to astrology is like, nobody's going to tell me what is predestined or like who I am, or like, you're not going to label me in a certain way. And I think that, you know, you're speaking to it from the context of self-awareness and how I can sort of notice what are some of my like things within my nature, but that I might want to work on or shift or, you know, that it it's time for is that, mm -hmm. isn't that why you guys are in business because you're helping mm -hmm. people shift what they what wasn't working for them? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I definitely, I listen to you on podcasts periodically, Deborah, and I've heard you on a couple different podcasts talk about this moment in history that we're going through, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like I have been a little bit obsessed with the idea personally that I feel like this is, you know, what we talk about in depth psychology in the context of like, um, an initiatory period and that we are being birthed into something new and we're going through these periods of deep discomfort and contractions. Um, and I, I just, I'm wondering how you're, you're speaking to this period in time when you talk to people about it or what your thoughts are on this moment in history. So, so first of all, there's no way that you can name and look, look across time. Hmm. It's such a funny thing. Every single time any major transition happens, we all go into terror. Like what mm -hmm. happened in 2000 when everyone was like putting all their water away because they were- Why 2K? Right. So we're, yeah, but this time there is seemingly a difference because there's more people than you ever knew here. 7.8 mm -hmm. billion. Never had this many people, never had this much consumption, never had this much. So we're really at a critical moment as far as population number, consumption, obviously, mm -hmm. and the carbon. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is just obvious. As an astrologer, I can comfortably say that we are in no uncertain terms about to enter a new era. It's called the Aquarian age. You've heard that term. Yes. There's no demarcation like it'll happen on June 2nd, 2024. It's not like that. It's an era shift. And I think it was the 60s mm -hmm. that the Aquarian age began. If you think about what mm -hmm. happened, I grew up in the 50s, and the 60s, we were all trying to be normal. Then came the 60s. It was like drugs, alcohol, sex, do whatever you want. 
the doors flew open. And that was the entrance of the Aquarian age saying, okay, you don't have to get married if you don't want, you don't have to have kids if you don't want, you don't have to have a job. You know, there's all these variations that we, I never grew up with that. We had a set pattern. So the, welcome to the Aquarian age. It is astrological and it is described right now in 2022, Saturn's in Aquarius, where the whole societies across the planet are being asked to reevaluate what does really work. Well, not much. Mm -hmm. Like if we're being honest, this whole virus just threw in our face. We don't know what's going on. I love listening every day to the next variation on the theme and no one knows what to do. You put the mask on, you take the mask off, you take the, the, the next thing. So the point is we're slightly confused to put it lightly. And this is a wonderful thing, said the astrologer, because now we're humbled. There's two mm -hmm. kinds of people. They're the ones that are humbled and the ones that are about to be. And the ones that are about to be are the ones going through an initiation. Yeah. And we are now entering humility because we cannot figure this thing out. I can't, I'm not pretending for a minute that I mm -hmm. understand. I, I mean, all I know is what I as an astrologer can tell you to keep you in balance on your chart. Like I can support you to be you. What else? I, I, I can't. So when you ask about the collective, my passion is that people learn astrology mm -hmm. and they become themselves guilt-free cards to completely uninhibitedly be who you are. And without that, anything else, because when I, you don't understand, when I grew up, we had to pretend yeah. normal was the big word. Yes. That's not happening right now in this Aquarian age. There ain't no such thing. Yeah. I have, well, you know, one of my business partners who's working with me right now, who's a girl, boy, girl, boy, I don't know what she is, but I'm so, I'm so impressed with her. I've watched her since the beginning. She's now taking different hormones. She's like, good for you. And I can see it right in her chart. Like you go for it, mm. girl, boy, girl, boy. I don't care what you are. I'm in love with you. Mm. Well, it's great though, too. I mean, it's what's so the, what you just said, which is so profound that I, I try to tell people as much as they'll listen is we can try to save the world all we want, but until you turn inward and you understand self and you understand what your role is in the collective, right? Like we can't change it from the collective down. You've got to change it from yourself up. Um, and, and that sounds like that's a lot of the astrology work. That you're My whole book mm -hmm. is there's one person at a time getting comfortable mm -hmm. with their skin and you will have power. Yep. I want to give people power back. Yeah. So the answer exactly. to your question is yes, the planet is going through a major transition and we are not even halfway through it and it's not going to get any easier. Mm -hmm. The structures are breaking. We're dismantling yeah. the old identity of normal. And the good news is anything goes. What would you like? I love it. Thank goodness. I think it's amazing. And I think humbled is absolutely the word that I feel like I have used about myself and this period of time more times than I can count over the last two years. I think that's that's spot on and so grateful to, to be humbled in the way that I have been. Look, look at where I'm <clears throat> alive. I live in the most beautiful place in the world. I, I'm on my knees every day, every day. Mm. I say, thank you. Every day, every day I'm in prayer. Every yes. day I say to someone somewhere, how can I be of service to you, for example. That's my my constant mantra that I do every day is who can I serve today? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if Same. everyone took that away from this podcast, just start asking every day, like, what could I do to make this place a little shinier? If you're bored, if you're unfocused, if you're depressed, if you're lonely, who can I serve today? You wouldn't believe how quick the whole thing, but if, if your ego is so hurt and you're mm -hmm. in therapy, <laughs> Because <laughs> so some power you've broken, good for you. You asked for help yeah. because that's the next thing. If you don't have the means to help someone, then you go to a therapist, as you guys all know, to say, I don't know what's blocking me, mm -hmm. but something's preventing my happy, my joy, my juju. Like I committed, I was depressed for so many years of my life and I committed myself to a life of joy. Mm -hmm. I have this joke that I'm the president of the Jews for Joy Club and I have no members. <laughs> Because I grew up in a family that went like this. Oi. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just, you won't believe what happened to me. I was like, oh my God, this is contagious. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so good. And now I've promised myself to do joy and I'm pretty good at it. Oh, you bring so much joy, Deborah. <laughs> I, 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 was, I did not come this way. So let's hear it for therapy. I didn't come this way. It was a practice. It's, it's work. Been, it's work. Yeah. It's wonderful work. 
Hmm. Yeah. And that's, I think that's important for a lot of people to understand. I mean, it's like people hear these terms like, oh, you know, gratitude practice and like happiness is a choice. And a lot of people get really miffed by that. And it's like, well, it's not a choice like la-di-da, I just turn it on one day. It actually takes a lot of hard work and you've got to be willing to roll up your damn sleeves and do the work every single day. Yeah. Do you do it? I do my best. I mean, sure. Right. There are some days that we all kind of fall off the the wagon, but you know, for me, and I don't know if this is my kind of earth element for sure, but for me, joy comes in the very small micro moments. You know, I find my joy in smelling the jasmine in the air. I find my joy in watching my kid master something, you know, she's only two and like watching her learn a new word. And it's like in that tiny little moment, that's where I find my joy. I'm not like a jump up and down kind of person when something big happens for me, it's much more grounded in like my moment by moment. I totally understand. And what about you? I want to hear your <laughs> I'm the jump up and down constantly. She is. This is why we compliment each other. She remember, she reminds me to jump up and down the big moments. <laughs> I'm the geeky little kid that's like, it's happening, V, it's happening. It's true. I know, I'm the geeky little kid too. Yeah. But not everyone's so lucky and that's why there's meds. And that's why people do therapy because some mm. people's serotonin levels, mm-hmm. they don't have that level of joy. And, and good for us that got it. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't think I, I was born this way. I do think it was work to sort of shift mm-hmm. my perception and, you know, really understand the life I'm living through a different lens. And that took me time. But I do feel like there were some things that once I saw them, I couldn't unsee them. And this is kind of where I've landed. I'm so mm. thankful. I'm so thankful that we have um, evolution. That mm. one of the things that I've learned as a therapist, because I was in private practice for over 40 years. It's crazy to think about. And I heard so many stories. God, I've heard so many stories and the, the, the disinherited, like the heartbreak that's occurred for me to see how humans treat humans mm-hmm. and the level of abuse that's occurred on this planet and the level of people's lack of consciousness. It's very difficult for me. I don't find this place easy. Mm-hmm. So that's where I had to do my work to like my little kid never went away. So I've always, I'm a Gemini, I'm a dipstick. So I get over, I get off on Jasmine. Are you kidding? Jasmine makes me crazy. Mm-hmm. Or two year, I could stare at two year olds all day. All day. But when it comes to the injustice, mm-hmm. when it comes to this word, I can't stand, you know, people starving, starvation, mm-hmm. that just, I, and then I short circuit. And then I have to just put myself into like, go back to work. Cause if I spent any length of time thinking about refugees, which I do from time, I go into meditation. I'm like, we're meditating for the people that are walking, looking for a place to live. Mm-hmm. It makes my heart break, but don't do that. You guys, you little depth people. We're not supposed to do that right now. So I do my best to navigate around that and do my best. If you read my book, one of my chapters in error is a man who spent 27 years in prison in mm-hmm. San Quentin that I helped get out. And now he's having the life he's having. In fact, his birthday is in three days and he's um, turning 65 and he now is married and his whole 27 years in San Quentin and he got out. So I've done what I could do to make a real impact in this world because there's so many things that I can't figure out how to fix. And it hurts me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's nicer to talk about. I know. (laughs) I'm like, oh no. Um, I mean, I feel like we have Deborah Silverman. I kind of want to ask you about what you see in our charts since you have them. It's like, let's talk about us. I'm let's like, stop no, talking let's... about that. <laughs> I'm like, yes, that's, there's something that's terrible. Hey, do you want me to just- You don't get to talk to Deborah Silverman every day, people. <laughs> just excited. Okay. So want me to start with yours? Say your name again. Danae. <clears throat> Danae. I'll remember that now, Danae. So you have uh, a very strong- personality like you, that's the thing. you got when you, you know this when you were born mars was on the sun no so once a year the red planet which is male was sitting on the sun because so the mm-hmm. sun moves a degree every single day <clears throat> around the sky it's very predictable we know every day when it's you know january 27th the sun's in aquarius or we we always know because the sun but the other planets hover and they do a much longer orb so the day you were born, here goes the sun around the sky, and it was exactly the same spot as Mars. Mm-hmm. So you're what we call a Martian. <laughs> <laughs> Calling it up now. A lot of male energy. That you, your male energy oh. is very strong, and you can't. You don't know what to. You know, you're you're like, let's go, let's go. I got this. You're you're a very strong doer, and to have someone sit next to you who's idle, you're like, what are we 
you do today? Yeah. So, yes. so that small piece of information, just knowing you're a Mars energy character tells me immediately that the red, it's a red planet. It's the only red planet that this red fire energy, even though it's not fire is you're, it's bugging you that you've got to be productive and you've got to <sighs> accomplish something and you never get, they never let you go. It's always calling your name, right? You're right. That is correct. Debra. She was just crying <laughs> around my fire a week ago about this exact same problem. <laughs> Yeah, that, you know, the astrology that I'm hearing or like things that I'm hearing are like, you need to rest. And I'm like, I cannot rest. I do not want to rest. I don't until know I'm to rest. <laughs> she said, please, Taurus, tell me how to rest. That's what she said to me. <laughs> you don't tell a Mars person how to rest. What you have to do is you have to expend enough energy, whether it's sexual, whether it's physical, and then you can rest. You can mm. if someone exhaust you, yourself. <laughs> That's like mean to say to somebody with Mars, just rest. They need to be expense. They need to like, and then Never, no I've never felt more seen. Thank you. I'm tired. You know, that's just mean. That's what I mean by psychology and astrology. You don't want to have something that's so natural to you be called out mm -hmm. as something's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Okay. Now I'm going to jump over to Vanessa just to keep this thing interesting. So Vanessa, you, when you were born, the moon and Pluto were together. This is so interesting. So we just talked about the sun and Mars, her personality is the sun, sun sign, and Mars is male. Now we're going to talk about the moon, which you have in Libra and Pluto, which are standing next to each other. So the moon is our inner world. Mm -hmm. It's the dark time. So if the sun, if her, if we're just talked about big male energy, that's got to do something. Yours is now talking about your inner world, but it's so intense, your inner world, because Pluto, the planet of power was standing right next to it. So you get emotional and then you become analytical. Like you're like moon and Libra, we're gonna analyze the shit out of this. We're gonna go underneath it. We're gonna go behind it. Then we're gonna go in front of it. And yep. by the way, I should probably write about this. Yep. I have some, I'll just journal for a little bit cause I got some more ideas I wanna write. So your intellectual, sure. your emotional body's intellectual. Mm -hmm. Go figure. Those two don't usually go together. Yeah, and you know what's crazy? My partner, his moon is in cancer. Let me tell you. <laughs> That's not easy. It's tough. Because <laughs> he wants to just go nonverbal and you want to talk. Oh, he just wants to be in all the feels and I just want to be in my I head. Nonverbal and in his feelings. Yeah. And you want to go. Mm -hmm. Logic. Mm -hmm. So that's the gift of astrology and compatibility. When we look at how do we partner and we have on my team, I have astrologers who just do relationships oh. or they just do personality assessment or they just work with children. Oh. Like it's the most valuable thing in the whole world is having a kid knowing their chart when you raise them. Mm -hmm. You know, I have this famous story about my son who was a double Aries and came home in eighth grade and he had hit the, the teacher called me. All the teachers were had him in the room. He came home with his little tail behind his and he was like, mom, I got in real trouble today. And I was like, who'd you hit? And he said the guy's name. And I was like, good for you. He was like, good for me. I was like, you're a double Aries. If you don't hit somebody and you don't get pissed off and you're not the one that stands up to the, who will? Well, that went over like a lead beloved. But he, <laughs> he was like, thanks mom. Like, thank you. Because I couldn't live one more mm. day listening to this shit. Yeah. You know? And so it gives permission to let the kid be acceptable mm -hmm. on their terms. I know I've tried to explain to people, you know, this isn't like the cosmopolitan uh, quiz in the back of the magazine where it's like, you know, who are you compatible with? Like when you really do your charts side by side, it, it has helped me understand him in ways that I never would have been able to understand him and help me understand myself in relationship to him and like why things trigger me the way they do or why certain things, you know, it, it's, it's really been eye opening and, and it's honestly changed my relationship with him. You're singing my song. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. sing to the choir. <laughs> what a funny image. So, so I value more than anything in the world that we, to your, back to your point about what the era is we're in, we're in the Aquarian age. This is the first time in her story, instead of his story, I'm sick of his story, history. Now we're calling it her story. This is the first time in her story that you could talk about astrology without people going, what? No, that's not to say, because you too, me too, I get those comments, like, what are you doing? And this is just a joke. And, but they're, in the, they're not as popular. You look on Instagram and there's 50,000 astrologers. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, retrograde, the whole world's talking about it. It's so cutest thing I've ever heard. It makes me smile. It's like when the yoga first came out and I was living in, I went to school in Los Angeles. When yoga first came out, I did the first yoga class. This is like 1980, I want to say 81. And it was so weird. 
like what? Because I was a I was a professional dancer. I was like, this is way too slow. This music is way too weird. And why are we on the? We're not even doing anything. This is like just like the weirdest pretzels. Fast forward, it turns into a billion dollar industry. Everyone and their cousins taking yoga. And by the way, your grandmother knows downward dog. <laughs> So when I, now you're at the era where I started bringing astrology, where I can say Mars is on your son. Now you're going to go Google Mars is on your son and you're going to learn all this information. And we never spoke it before, but what about your kids growing up going, mom, remember me? I have no fire in my chart. So don't ask me to go to that party. Hmm. And you go, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. I already see it happening. I already know. I mean, I have, you know, my little one's only two. Denise is almost five. And I look at like my sister right now, she's young, way younger than me. She's only 21. And just the difference in the generational, you know, it's like you were saying that you have somebody on your team where you're like, I don't care. I love you anyway. I mean, I look at my sister and her age group and generation, and it just blows my mind. Like they're so the things that I think I thought was a big deal when I was a kid, they're like, it's so trivial to them. Like, they're like, don't even, don't even bother me with that nonsense. Right. Like we've got bigger fish to fry. We got to save the climate. Like there's just this stuff going on in their minds that I, I just can't fathom having in the front of mine when I was 21. So beautiful. I mean, yeah. it's sad. I love it. They're thinking about, well, the anxiety and everything that's coming out of that, right. That generation holds, I think a lot more information and, and, That's and stress. True. Yeah. I don't think we have more than five years before the account, before the environment. I mean, if you watch chasing coral, have either of you watched that film hmm. I just did my first podcast, it won't be coming out, but I've done a series of about 12 scientific um, professionals who are really experts. It, it's horrible. And no one wants to talk about it because we're all in denial because we can't cope with the implications. We're all still using plastic everywhere I look, everywhere I look, everywhere I look is plastic. So nothing's changed. Mm -mm. No one's not flying. No one's walking more. No one's changing their diet. Like a little bit, we're doing all this new age um, vegan, but it's not having the impact yet until we're in crisis. It's my first right. chapter of the book, The Missing Element is Crisis. Because yeah. until there's crisis, the, to your point, initiations where you're smacked, we just sleep through the movie. Mm -hmm. Cross our fingers and hope that somebody else will make the change or that we won't have to do the hard work or yeah. We don't well, want to be inconvenienced. Yeah. And I guess I always wonder about that from an astrological perspective, Deborah, because I feel like before 2020 happened, I heard astrologers saying something big is going to happen that yes. is going to bring some recalibration to what we've been doing to the earth. And so everyone knew, yeah. Someone walked up to me the other day and um, I hadn't seen in three years. And she said, I remember you saying 2020 was going to be the turning point. It's, it's not a surprise. Hmm. Like this is real. We are in a transition. And I think what I really want to say is give us permission. I, this is a prayer. Give us permission to be humbled enough to find our way to our personal strength to handle mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Like, let me be humble enough to say, I do believe that we're in trip. How many of you listening, I'd love to hear, know in your heart of hearts that something's about to happen. Like we can feel it brewing. Now that's mm -hmm. different than 2K. And that's different than when the century changed. It's different when this is a 7.8, everyone you ever knew is here. It's, yeah, how many it's energetic. Like, I want to go down. I want to go down. Your little five-year-old, your little two-year-old. This is gonna, but we, they, they probably, I assume some level of consciousness was there to say, be prepared. Mm -hmm. This reality will not resemble what your parents grew up with. So are you ready for that? And they were like, yeah, bring it on. So we have in our hands, these young millennials, that's part of my other prayer. Help me be humbled enough and strong enough to be myself and to acknowledge the youth, which is what I work with. My, I have 50 women in my company. I only work with women and I always empower all of them. Like you, let me look at your chart and make sure you're in the right job. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure you're being your, I don't want to play with you if you're squished. Mm. There'll be no squished women in my company. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's worse than a squished woman. <laughs> but, you know, to the point I think you were making before, I think that is what like really excites me about the way that things are shifting and about this time is that that is something that is like a normal no, a more normal thing for a boss yeah. to do. Like, let me see your chart. Let me know you in your essence and see how we will work together in that way. I feel like five years ago, people would have been like, my what? Like, I don't yeah. know, maybe. No, you're so right. 
Maybe you well, did and that generationally, five years ago. I mean, generationally too, like we, like the people that are in their mid thirties, early forties, like we are in these positions. So even from just a generational perspective, you've got a lot more people coming into like the, the kind of managerial roles that are a different generation. And we're like, no, we're not going to function the way that you guys function. Like you, it's time for you guys to sit down. We got to come in here. We got to take over, you know, we're doing things differently. And that I find to be really empowering too. Can you be specific? I'm not sure I got that. Like generationally, they're not playing the same role in their business as far as sitting in the same seat or doing the right. Like, so like when I look at, even if you look at like politics, it's like when you look at the people who are aging out of being at the top, right? Like being in power, there's a very different way that let's say, you know, like, let's say the boomer generation. I mean, obviously you're, you're, I guess you're technically part of the boomer generation, right? But like as a generation, they, they were very different in their way of, I want to say controlling, but I guess like managing and running teams and running companies as like the millennial generation, right? And now the millennial generation is coming in and we're at the seat, the head of the table, right? And we're making the decisions. Well, yes. And I think the best way to put that into concrete terms is I live in cyberspace. Yeah. Nobody in my family ever lived in cyberspace. I, I Like I don't have to put a little suit on with nylons and nail, you know, like I don't have to do any of that stuff. Yeah. I get to just live inside of my little space. Go, I work and I get to get off work when I want. And reality, like there's so many people I know who have little headsets on like you two and they look like they're spaceship drivers. And that was not my grandmother. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and it feels like the difference with the information age to me is more that it's like the creatives, the people who see things from a little bit, like the, the long haired, freaky people and the weirdos. We're the sort of and the geeks. Ones, yeah, we're <laughs> sort of the ones that are like, no, we, we see some things that maybe- yeah the larger normal is not seeing. And, you know, I feel like I've heard my mom say so many times, like, oh, what this has done to the school children to be out of school. And I'm like, it's irrelevant. Like they're not going to be learning the same stuff. It's pointless. Like who or should they? Everything is shifting. And I think that's, that's what it's about. It's more like, you know, like the creatives and the ways that people think see, I can't speak. The way that people see things differently is now being acknowledged as like, this is what we need to expand yeah. as a collective. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great that this is the thing for me, knowing as an astrologer that no one ever believed in this stuff before. And now yeah, this is acceptable conversation that therapy, do you know how much stigma there was to do oh therapy when I grew up? You didn't yeah. tell anybody. Absolutely. Now it's like my therapist, this and my, th like now it's totally cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's an exciting you, time always, to be alive. Like, I would love to make a list of all the radical departures that, because I have a, a good friend that I'm hanging out with who's a couple of years older than me, but we're like headed towards 70. It's so hard to imagine. And um, I look back, because I don't feel like I'm headed towards 70, but I am headed towards 70. And I think about all the ways that my reality, what I grew up with, and how secretive you had to be about your sexual preferences mm -hmm. or how unconscious you had to, like fearful you had to be about saying psychological depression was a word anxiety we didn't have that word mm -hmm. yeah. I, nobody even knew what it meant yeah and now you say it like so like i've got anxiety like i was just with a friend the other day and he was like don't talk about the doctor you're making me anxious and i was like Can, you can't admit that word didn't exist i'm yeah. making you anxious like and then then came my healer i'll, I'll help you what's triggering you <laughs> It's okay. You've got a therapist sitting right in front of you. My mom has actually joked around when I started using all the words to bring it up. And she'll be like, when I was in my twenties, she's like, we didn't even have seatbelts. Like, she's like, That's nobody great. talked about drunk driving. She would say this to me like drunk driving. What is that? We would just get in the car and go home. And I'm like, Oh my God, what? <laughs> and I just, we hid in the back room to smoke a joint. <laughs> like you could not, are you kidding? We'd be like, like this, like this. Like, <laughs> I can't even imagine. I wish sometimes, you know what I wish sometimes that we could do like a teleport machine. Like remember in that movie back to the future where they took the guy all the way back and his underwear had Calvin Klein on it. And then the girls <laughs> she thought that was his name. Started calling him Calvin. I, like, I wish so much we could do that. Like go back into time where the other reality was. Cause I remember being in the fifties. I remember being little in those little cars. Well, they weren't little, but Huge. we can't remember. We can't remember. So we have no reference. And so we know the future's scary. And I'm an astrologer here to tell you it will be scary. But what we don't recognize is right now we're peaking. This yeah. is the best lifetime you've ever had. 
I mean, it feels that way. I, you know, I, I, I think it's amazing, but I think when you say that, it's a nice reminder. Vanessa and I joke sometimes, like if we really want to activate our mothers, we'll talk about energy and watch their heads just energy. Say, what are you, what are you saying? talking about? <laughs> yeah, that's so cute. But that's another one, energy, <laughs> mom gets reactive. Of course she does. So, so I want to tell everyone that the next five years from 2020 to 2027, it has a very strong resemblance of like the best times of your life. And then we're going to start watching the dismantling mm -hmm. of the environment. Like you, all you have to do is watch Chasing Coral. 85% of the coral in the world is gone. Yeah. If 85% mm -hmm. of the trees in the world were gone, we would be in hysterics. We would well, all be wouldn't be here. I mean, shit, 85%, we'd be dying. Literally, we'd actually be dead. <laughs> well, that's what's going on in the yeah. ocean. Mm. So, mm. but we don't talk about it. They say there'll be no fish, but we, we can't even, we, our brains aren't built for truth. We're built for pretend games. And, and thankfully, cause I have a lot of fun pretending. I, you know, I wonder, as you say that, I think about Eckhart Tolle saying like the end of the human race might not be the worst thing in the world. And we have a choice right now to evolve or die. What do you think, Deborah? do you think? Today says something so heavy and then she laughs. laughs. What do you think about that? <laughs> You know, I don't know that it's the, I mean, we're not going to go extinct entirely. The species will continue. The, <clears throat> the earth will surely continue. The earth mm. is an unbelievable survivor, but what will happen. And I'm excited about it is the model of inequity of social injustice of violence of evil will be addressed because mm. it is dated and we don't speak to it, how we let ourselves tolerate this. So yes, we're going to change models. There's going to be a template shift, whether it's AI or whether we're going to go to metaverse. There is an alteration that's coming soon to your neighborhood. And we are peaking right now. And this is the best lifetime you've probably ever had. You eat like a king and a queen. Like we have queen, we, you know, yeah. we just push a button and then there's food in front of us. The dishes are done. The hot water comes out. The heat goes on. The plane takes off. Like we've never had this before. So to your point, we aren't going extinct, but we will be adjusting the matrix of what we considered acceptable. Yeah. And I will be the first one in line to say, I'm willing to change. Like yeah, I stopped driving my car. I basically ride an electric bike everywhere I go. Yeah, I guess that's a little like, I will feel flooded if I think about it too much. I have to frame Same. it in a way that I can hold it. And for me, it feels like all of this suffering has always been here. All of this injustice has always been present. It's just a little bit more public uh, magnified yeah, and it's in your yeah face like now. we can't ignore it as much and that's good because hopefully it's causing us to recalibrate what needed to be recalibrated for a very long like, time what would it be like if this planet was kind mm -hmm. what if we actually what if we really knew the word kind yeah like you're two little kids because you see with little kids they're not kind they grab things they throw <laughs> things they bite mine. They, <laughs> yeah mine, 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 mine. and so we have to teach kindness but we aren't living it yet but we will we're upgrading mm -hmm. we are upgrading the operating system and the way to do that is to take astrology and stick it in your brain because that is a timeless matrix that will survive everything it has already it's five thousand years old it is the doorway that allows your system to return to balance because once you learn how to be yourself you know it's funny to say this because you know i never would have thought of myself as being balanced because i was so out of balance for so much is why i became a therapist and now at this sweet age of a thousand, I, I say I'm 60,000 years old. I feel balanced. Mm. Now I don't want to be tested. <clears throat> <Please>. <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> don't, be, don't be mean. And I do feel like I've reached a, sta a state of meditation every day, eating really well, saying my prayers, mm -hmm. being able to pray over my food. I, I really have created a practice. Yeah. And I invite all of you to say, if you're not there yet, I'm not, you can, if you have to say, I'm not balanced, like if you know that your relationship with your husband or your kid or your food or your money or your home is not bad, then say it, seek help and know that everything evolves. Mm. That's the good news. We're evolving. We're, it's beautiful. Constantly. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy. This, this reality never, I understand why people take hallucinate. Like, look at the new movement now. Everyone's microdosing. I'm like, I'm already high. I do not need that. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, it's, that's redundant. You give me some kind of drugs. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I was already trying to keep my feet. Like that doesn't help me, but oh I gosh. value the people that can do it. I watch and they, they microdose. And I'm like looking at them going, how is it in there? <laughs> <laughs> Let me in on the joke. 
Oh my gosh, Deborah, I, I could just listen to you forever. It makes my heart so happy. <laughs> um, but we do have a lightning round of questions we ask all of our hey, guests, so and we want to be I mindful of your start. time. Yes. Okay. okay. So who have been your greatest teachers, mentors, guides along your journey, whether they're people that you've actually known or people whose work has impacted you greatly? I just felt a wave go over me. I would say um, the first teacher was the one that taught me the four elements backwards. That was um, the emissaries. They were called that cult or whatever that thing as I was in. I had a lover slash boyfriend who was a Buddhist who has continued to be in my life. And he's taught me about non-attachment, which was the worst lesson I ever learned. I hated mm. every minute of it, but it worked. Um, let's see. Then I had a woman who was an elder who was this high priestess who somehow recognized me at the sweet age of 21 and pulled me aside and taught me that I was a priestess. I didn't know, but mm -hmm. she named it and gave me permission. And I would say um, my children, like I've been a very humble, I prayed every day of my pregnancy, let me bring in being in more conscious than me that I could be its student as well as its teacher. And I mm -hmm. got that. I got a being more conscious than me that became my teacher as well as my student. And then um probably my best friend. I have a friend who I talk to every day for the last 30 years and she's like a rock and, and she has really held my heart and kept me safe. Yeah. <laughs> so Deborah, what do you, what do you find yourself um, doing when you find yourself in a state of flow? So that state where you could just blink your eyes and six, eight hours just go by. What is flow for you? Making love. <laughs> Um, writing, I can get lost in writing. I can get lost in, uh, someone's knocking on my door. I can get lost at making love writing. Oh, bike riding. I go on my bike every day on my electric bike for hours. And I don't even know what day it is or what time it is. And I just follow the paths and I go a long, long yeah. distance. And then I find my joy with the question. Yeah. That's, that's the perfect answer for that question. Yes. <laughs> Making love, love bike writing and writing. Okay, I'll take those three. <laughs> mm, I feel like we touched on this one a little bit, but what breaks your heart, Deborah? You know. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, don't make me say it again. She's like, I told you. I'm not saying it again. <laughs> yeah. And then, so this is this is the big kicker question. What is your favorite food? Well, arugula. Is that weird? No, I, I love it. I love everything about what you just said arugula. I mean, I love this arugula, but it has to have a bit of um, feta, avocado, and garlic in it. Is that the answer that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, that's my mouth's watering. I'm, so I'm a I am a vegetarian rabbit, and I have been since I was a kid. I don't eat meat, so I've been eating arugula. <laughs> so people make fun of me because I eat it like almost every day. It's making me happy because I'm a vegetarian and my son reads this book, Linus, the vegetarian dinosaur. And it's like, Linus pounced on a stalk of arugula. And my kid says arugula every time. So you will appreciate that. But I, eat, I do eat fish. I live in Hawaii and I do eat fish. Oh, that's You're amazing. talking to two other vegetarian <laughs> dinosaurs here too. So <laughs> we get it. Oh, we are wow. so, so grateful that yes. you came on and I'm, I'm super excited. Um, you know, you have this, this new class coming out. So tell our listeners, you know, where they it can connect happens, with you, where they yeah. get information. Yeah. So it only happens twice a year. So I don't know when your podcast, when is it going out? We're going to do it. Like we'll do it now. We can bump it up because yeah. it's starting okay. soon, right? Well, it, yes, it, it, the doors close on the 31st. So you got to hurry up, but, but, um, yeah, but then if you don't do that, there is, you know, the shift network. Yes. I always want to call it the shit network, but that's not appropriate. <laughs> so I have to slow down and say shift. <laughs> the shift network is putting me on starting 222022. There'll be a, like, a, I think it's like 200, like the class, the school is $1,000, not for you guys, but it's $1,000 to do the school. Okay. But the shift network is like, I want to say it's like two or 300 for a seven week class on learning, the not learning astrology, not like the way we teach it. Yeah. We teach it. So when you're done, like the both of you at the end of level one, you can apply it to every client you have and you would okay. be able, I swear you'd be able to. Um, but the shift network is doing something special around the archetypes of the psychology of astrology. So it's more general. Oh, it's cool. cool. That's coming up on two, 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 two. Um, 
And then you just go to my website, Deborah Silverman Astrology. And we have, I give off so much free material. Like, you know, I want everyone to play in the stars. I, I, I don't, on my planet, they don't have money. No, hey, man, my planet either. They just share everything. Yeah. Well, Let's smell the jasmine. I love it. Deborah, you are such an absolute joy. Just thank you so much for your work and the way that you show up in the world for all of us. It's really such a joy to meet you. And we're really grateful you did this. Thank you. You're so welcome. Makes me want to cry. Oh, <laughs> so grateful. So grateful. I'm going to be buzzing all day now. <laughs> okay. I'm going to um, push a button. What do I do now? Oh, you're going to push the button. You, we'll just push the button. <laughs> This is the I universe mean. we live in. First century, we're in the Aquarian age. You just push a button. My grandmothers never push buttons. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Thank you.